last but by no means least, we'll hear from the College of Social Sciences and Law, presenting on enhanced student engagement through UDL interventions. And our faculty partners from the College of Social Sciences and Law are Dr. Marin Nirahala, Dr. Kevin Costello, Dr. Rachel Farrell, and Dr. Ernesto Vasquez de la Guila. Hi everyone, and thanks. thanks for watching. So, my name is Maureen Nirahali, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Policy, Social Work, and Social Justice. Um, and I'm going to talk today, we're all going to talk, I guess, really about a kind of plus one that we implemented in our um, different schools and programs. Um, so, okay. So, I teach on a, a two year professional master's in social work program. So, we have roughly 50 to 55 students in each year of the program. And as you can imagine, on a social work program, we have many topics that we cover that are very sensitive. So, for example, child abuse, domestic violence, adult safeguarding, um, you know, drug use, working with um, offenders, and so on. And on a social justice, human rights, and probation module that I um, co teach on with my colleague, Dr. Marie Keenan, she does half the module, I do the other half. Some of the topics that I cover include race and racism, working with traveling community, working with LGBTQI populations, and working with refugees and international protection applicants. And so the, the sensitivities there are obviously uh, great in a lot of those uh, discussions. So in some, in some discussions in social work, the, sen the sensitivities or the the, if people in the room are impacted um, by the issues, they, it can kind of be hidden. So maybe you grew up in foster care, but nobody knows that. Whereas when you're discussing race and racism, it's usually very visible in the room that there are some people in the class who are of the minority ethnic um, uh, group. And so sometimes they can feel maybe under the spotlight. So for years, I was discussing these issues and the conversations were really uncomfortable. It was really difficult to teach. There was tension in the classroom. Obviously, the students who've experienced um, racism, it was really, really difficult for them. But it was also difficult for white majority students who were maybe for the first time reflecting on their role in perpetuating racism. So I realized I really needed to do something different. And I suppose using UDL principles, I tried to, to achieve that. Um, so for what I did was I, this is my plus one, quite a, a, a simple thing in many ways, which has really, I think, helped in the class. So I sent an email to, to students, um, invited the whole class, inviting anyone who wished to be involved in the preparation of these classes to come forward and to, to, to meet with me. So this year, for example, I had five students who came forward, four were of an ethnic minority background, one was um, from an LGBTQI community, and we discussed uh, the challenges that arise in these classes. We asked the students, I, I, we agreed as a group that sending a Google form to the rest of the class where the students could then pose some questions would be really helpful. So one of the things was students are afraid to ask things because they're afraid they're going to be seen as racist, they're afraid of offending, then other students are, you know, don't have experienced really important lived experiences, but they struggle to say them in class because it's so difficult for them. So people submitted questions in the Google form. I shared these with this preparation group in advance of class, and people from the preparation group then, um, you know, kind of said, okay, I can take that question, I can answer that, drawing on my own lived experience um, of, for example, racism. I have one minute left. So these were efforts to um, engage in multiple means of expression and engagement and multiple means, or sorry, multiple means of expression and multiple means of action um, and expression. Um, so there were a total of 17 questions were posed in these um, Google Forms. So two examples here. How can we ask questions about other people? So for example, clients or peers in relation to ethnicity, religion, sexuality. And then the second one, what do you think the other person who's been racially abused is feeling when no one stands up for them at the bus stop? And I suppose what was interesting here was that I think the second question here probably came from somebody with lived experience of racism who was asking a question not really to get an answer, but to get students to reflect on what this might be like for them. So in terms of the impact, there was 17 uh, students responded to a feedback survey and they either said it would be very important or important to use a similar approach again. And just to finish with two quotes from, from this feedback survey. So the first quote uh, on your left is uh, participation on the sharing of the lived experience during lectures brought the subject to life. And I think it was valuable learning and made the learning space quite inclusive. Um, it also made some of the subjects less intimidating and less awkward. 
And then the second one, I think he did a great job incorporating students' lived experience and supported those of us who did want to share our experiences, which was really empowering. I know from chatting to people after the classes that the topics generated a lot of um, needed discussion about racism and discrimination. Thank you. This is forward and we can see your slides in front of you then. This is back and just stay near the mic. Okay. Okay, so uh, my name is Kevin and I teach in the School of Law and the, um, the project that I uh, took as uh, my is, uh, is a module, uh, Employment Law Contracts, which is a doctrinal legal subject, including elements of uh, domestic and European law. And what makes this uh, subject slightly interesting from a diversity point of view is that the, the large percent, about 20% of the class, come from continental Europe. Um, and this group faces a, a series of barriers. Uh, there are differences in learning, there's differences in substantive law, there are differences in methodology, there are differences in assessment. Um, and every year this, this cohort would approach the, the, the class with, in a state of, of acute anxiety and this would demonstrate itself in them approaching me, usually in the form of a small little delegation, this would happen routinely, um, and, uh, and expressing nerves about the forthcoming year. And I would always provide this kind of complacent and anodyne kind of, well, you'll acclimatise yourself, it'll be immersive, and you know, the grades will be fine in the end and all the rest of it. Um, and, and so I decided that that was no longer tolerable. And uh, it, this year I took as my vantage point then the, um, the, the, the uh, as my audience, uh, the perception of this cohort of students. And um, I, um, uh, 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 in order then uh, to um, implement a series of substantive steps, I took uh, just four uh, modest steps. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I introduced, a, at the beginning of term, a detailed glossary of, uh, of common law or of Irish uh, legal terminology. Uh, and this was inspired, of course, by the UDL standard of clarifying uh, vocabulary and um, and, uh, and symbols. And on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, glossary. There's a, there's a space in, uh, in Brightspace for doing this. Um, secondly, uh, uh, these students um, also come from different legal cultures, which have different means of uh, assessing and uh, in order then to provide proper expectations, a dedicated uh, assignment workshop was uh, set up both to tutor those students in uh, Irish or common law uh, techniques for uh, the present presentation of legal material and also uh, Irish techniques uh, in terms of um, a a assessment. A, um, a, a third um, a, 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 a reform which I introduced uh, involved placing uh, lecture notes as well as slides uh, in advance of the, the lectures. Now, of course, the traditional lecture uh, offers very limited uh, learner choice. It, it advantages those who can physically attend and, and who can absorb material uh, and comprehend and transcribe material at a very rapid pace. Um, all of us, in fact, in practice, need several exposures to material and, and often attending lecture, having had prior exposure to the material, makes it more satisfying and makes it more interesting. Um, a, um, and the, 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 the slide on the right uh, includes uh, just an opening page from uh, one of those uh, uh, lecture notes, uh, which are about 5,000 words in length and are fully referenced. And of course, it means the lecture itself is better stru structured, organized, and, uh, and, and precise. And then fourthly, uh, everyone is now using it, but it is ex particularly useful in, in my discipline. Um, uh, a part of my lecture would always involve a kind of a, an answering hypothetical problem questions. Um, the existing technology, things like poll everyone and clickers and so on, are fine for multiple choice or yes, no type answers, but they don't uh, respond properly to the kind of independent answer or referencing that's required in, uh, in my discipline in law. The one technology which does is, um, is, is Padlet, and this removes barriers to those like that student uh, group who, for example, may feel self-conscious about um, ab about um, embarrassing themselves in front of the class because it enables uh, anonymous uh, uh, contributions. Uh, so the, the general kind of personal lesson, I suppose, was that making the, the needs of one interest group your point of reference can benefit 
all learners, because I think the whole class benefits from things like tablets or, or, or uh, 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 lecture notes or glossaries. Hi everybody, um, so my name is Rachel Farrell and I work in the School of Education um, and I'm direct, the Director of the Professional Master of Education programme. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, as Warren said, just our um, plus one. Um, so I've just in, recently uh, received the digital badge, I was delighted to get that. Um, so what I did as part of that was I looked at the assessment of a module on the PME programme. So we have, it's a two year um, postgraduate programme and I looked at the, a module in year one of the programme where we have 120 students and I wanted to implement um, a digital storytelling alternative form of assessment and the reason I did that was for a, a few reasons. One is um, in teacher education we have to keep an eye to national priorities in education and one is that, you know, the digital transformation and we have to um, do our part for that. So we in teacher education are like in a fishbowl that, you know, students are looking at us. Are we practicing what we preach? So if we're expecting them to use digital storytelling in their teaching, we have to show that we're doing the same. So we have been um, working with the Professional Development Service for Teachers on developing a module they come in and support us. Um, we've been doing that for the past few years, but I wanted this year to bring that more into the module. And I, I believe, um, Dr. Tobin, that when, when we're looking to try and change practice, I believe we have to change our assessment as well. And I believe that we don't always have to assess through essays. So in this particular module, we gave the choice to students to uh, give back the assessment in the form of a digital story or the traditional form of um, uh, essay if they wanted to. So just to explain what digital storytelling is, it's a practice of using computer-based tools to tell stories that revolves around the idea of combining the art of stories with a variety of multimedia, including graphics, text, recorded or, um, audio nar narration, video clips, and our music. And the trick is to get the right balance and not to overload. So the way that I implemented it is uh, there is a year-long module <coughs> called Pedagogy and Portfolio where the students learned the skill of digital storytelling. But we want them to apply that skill then to another module, so we're showing the links across the modules. So I actually um, took some of the Philosophy for Education module this year because a colleague was on maternity leave and I gave, I, being honest, I threw the kitchen sink at one lecture um, when I did uh, John Dewey and Paulo Freire, and I modelled it by having a digital story and using anticipation guides and doing all the things that you'd want a student to do. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of the students chose those two philosophers to, uh, as their focus for their assignment. So I think that maybe that particular lecture made an impact that day. Um, now, what's interesting as well is that the students were given the choice, 120 students were given the choice to do the digital story, but only 13 decided to do that. And it was interesting that they were nervous of an implementation dip. So I had to work with them as a little focus group to reassure them that they wouldn't dip like I wasn't promising a grade, but I was promising that they were going to be supported so that if they take a risk and step outside, we're always encouraging them to step outside their comfort zone. So the 13 that did that, um, they came up with some nice digital stories. And very quickly, you know, we have to remain robust and there has to be, you know, um, theoretical and practical underpinnings. So this is the digital storytelling process that does, it does involve research, it does involve planning, it does involve referencing, but it just allows you to do it in a very creative way. Um, and this to sum up, these are, that's Jake, give me permission to use his picture there. Um, I got to know the 13 students very well as part of this process. They're doing brilliant work in schools. One student uh, did a digital story competition with her students and 20 students won a bike worth 400 euro for a video they did for a competition. The link there has all the um, stories and there's just some feedback you can read yourself that the students gave and um, so we're hoping to expand this particular assessment next year. Thank you.
sorry. Uh, so I decided to use my four minutes to actually invite you to the journey in, in this roadmap that I created uh, for my modules. Initially, um, I created this roadmap in the context of the uh, teaching and learning diploma that, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that I um, um, took part of and to, uh, to show to, um, my teaching philosophy, but then became more and more complex. I uh, included uh, issues of EDL, um, EDI, and then uh, when I was uh, uh, um, uh, exposed to UDL, now it's become frame also for that. Uh, so the journey, there are 10 destinations. The journey starts uh, in Peru, so that's my first bias, my home country. So you see here destination one, that's uh, the Peruvian and the Inca flag. Uh, that's um, the introduction of the module. So students um, are directed to Brightspace. So this platform is Padlet, doesn't replace uh, Brightspace, but it's just a friendly access to, to all this journey. Uh, they can use this QR uh, code also, so they have constantly, um, uh, it's accessible through your, to their smartphone. Something that I spent some time is um, uh, explaining my uh, teaching philosophy. Um, I guess the, one, the, the ones that are relevant for, uh, for today are the first one, which is I understand learning as a, I use the metaphor of a kaleidoscope. Uh, so everybody is unique, every uh, diversity is not only recognized in my classroom, but it's also value. Um, so th that's the metaphor I use to explain UDL, uh, intersectionality, the coloniality. I guess for the coloniality, the, the most powerful thing I, used, I love to say in my classroom is that uh, our students need to get used to the, the thick accents that they hear, not only come from their classmates, but also from their lecturers. Um, then uh, something also is very important to me is uh, to queer the curriculum. Um, so uh, we discuss each, um, uh, the hidden um, heteronormative curriculum in, in our classrooms. Um, I'm inspired by Terry Barrett and their notion of hard fun. So I expect that my classrooms, my students do hard, uh, work hard, but also have some fun. So coming back to destination three, so then we move to Greenland. Uh, so this is the case study. Uh, so they're exposed to case studies from the global so south on the global north. Uh, so we, um, I guess the, the biggest lesson is here to recognize that what we learned is a fracture that is produced um, uh, outside the, the global north. Then we move to destination four, which is um, Europe. And in this destination, my students are uh, I, uh, randomly assigned a country, so they need to become an expert on that country and uh, do research that is relevant to that particular module. Um, and that, that um, uh, foster individual um, uh, learning, but also in class and, and also um, outside classroom activities. Then we move to Africa. Here I have a lot of uh, different dynamics, class dynamics. I adapt um, these dynamics depending of, of is a small or big classroom. And also my students know these dynamics and sometimes they, uh, they, um, they choose what, which ones we want to uh, uh, to discuss in class. Destination six, uh, Middle East. Uh, this is the time that we discuss the, the midterm uh, reflection. What are we doing? Destination uh, uh, seven, um, a virtual, uh, the virtual gallery. So in this destination, I group the students um, based on regions. For instance, here, uh, let's say destination three. So this Asia, uh, you will see all the uh, beautiful work that, uh, that they produce using different means uh, of expression, could be videos, could be uh, pictures, etc. cetera. Uh, destination uh, eight, we are running. Uh, I love um, um, artifacts, uh, so and I start um, working on that, sharing my own artifact. This is my students' artifacts. This is mine. Uh, so because I think that sharing my own vulnerability, sharing my own um, uh, uh, cultural artifact, in this case, is uh, my male butterfly, uh, creates a safe space so they can also share their own uh, their own artifacts. Uh, come back to destination. Uh, where, where are we? Destination 10, um, uh, diversifying the, the, main, the means of um, assessments. Uh, so we have, sorry, that's the R map. Uh, that's a, an extra additional material. 
Uh, anyway, they have um, uh, six um, or seven different types of assessments, including videos, etc. And I finalized the, the last destination, uh, sorry, destination nine, previous to, to the assessment. I finalized the, um, all my modules with this dynamic that I created uh, with the Gardi and uh, to how to um, um, uh, foster uh, inclusion and diversity in the classroom. So each student is assigned um, five identi identities randomly, uh, and we discuss uh, based on this, um, uh, this new identity. So a person could be um, a, a woman, a traveler, um, um, with HIV, HIV positive, older person, etc., and that really brings back um, all the, the journey. So every every destination um, is a, a particular uh, task, a particular moment that I want to address in the classroom. And finally, I use the metaphor of a travel agency. So I'm the travel agent who is facilitating uh, um, this journey for uh, for all of them. Uh, thank you. I hope you enjoy the journey. 